up and seeing that. It was a little bit of a shock, I have to say. Um, we're talking about tables, uh, and we're going to continue to talk about them. Um, we're going to follow the same pattern that we sort of did with forms. That is, we went over the basics of them last time, and I think we covered that pretty well. Today we're going to talk about uh, styling and accessibility options. And because there's a couple of extra tags that, that go with tables that we, we didn't talk about last time that um, assist with accessibility, but also sort of provide you the hook to do a little bit of styling with the table. So that's what we're going to cover uh, today. I have graded the, the designs, and I would encourage you to make sure you um, have read the feedback that I've given you, and if you have any questions, talk to me about that. All right, anyhow. Um, Well, so you, you can you, you can turn it in, and you always get at least some credit. So, yeah, if you haven't turned it in, by all means, do that as soon as you can. All right, last time we were looking at a table like this, and we said that we had uh, a table containing, like, the average temperatures in different cities around the world. And as we noted last time, this is a table because there are rows and columns like you'd have an Excel worksheet. So that's what we mean when we say a table. And that's what you should be putting in a table tag. And again, we briefly mentioned how back in the old days, web developers used tables to sort of make grids on the page and put stuff in so that they could align it. Um, and we also mentioned that if you have learned to do that, if you've done some web development in the past, to, to not continue to do that because that's not a, a good practice. It's a very inflexible practice. You can get it to work on a page, but if you decide to change the layout, you're kind of stuck. All right? And flexibility of layout is always important as far as web design goes because you never know how big the person's screen is going to be on the other end. Uh, and when you throw in mobile, that, that issue becomes um, taken to a, to a much greater degree even. So here's what we have, um, and again, let's take a look at, at the code to review. And then we'll go on to add some new tags to the mix. Notice the HTML for this is very simple. We're only using four different tags. We have a table tag that wraps around everything. We have TR tags. A table consists of a number of table rows. Each table row then contains either THs or TDs. THs being table headers, TDs being uh, table data. And we mentioned that tables, like everything else in, in HTML, the way that they're going to actually look is going to depend on, first of all, um, any CSS that you apply. And then secondly, if you don't specify CSS, it's going to be the browser's default behavior. So we saw things like if we do not set the width of the table, how wide do we make it? Um, and things like that. So if there's no style whatsoever, by default, the THs are centered and bold, and the TDs are left aligned and not bold. And by default, the columns are the size that they need to be to fill uh, or to fit the biggest uh, piece of data in them. So, for example, the first column for city, the biggest piece of data in that is the, the city Rio de Janeiro, so that's how wide it is. The other three columns, January, July, and October, the widest thing in those columns is the name of the month. So that's how big that is. All right. Of course, any of that we can control via our CSS. So we can give the table a width and a minimum width. We can set a border on the table and 
do all kinds of things with that. Notice I defined warm city, TD, if we wanted to. The question that, that a few people asked is, what if I wanted to highlight one row or even one cell? Well, you can do that, again, the same way that you could do that with any HTML. If there's one link that's special on your page, if there's one heading that's special on your page, you can either assign it a class or you can assign it an ID. You would assign it an ID if there's literally only one, all right, that, that you wanted to um, designate as being special. You would use a class if there's potentially more than one. So in this case, we said, what if we wanted to highlight the cities who had really warm temperatures? So I made a class for warm city, and then I applied that to the two cities that were a lot warmer than the, than the rest of them. OK. The f next several tags that we're going to talk about relate to um, accessibility. And, but, but again, they also have styling implications as well. One thing about tables, again, is, is just like with forms and just like with a lot of other things, people visually, when they see it, they can very easily come to some conclusions like what the table's about. For example, without any sort of labels here, You'd probably, if you just saw this, you probably would have a pretty good idea that this was temperature. All right? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But if you look at this, it sort of makes sense. Because we can see the table all in one shot. All right? We can see the table and we can easily see the rows and columns and how they're associated together. That 89 means Rio de Janeiro in January. 83 is Cleveland in July, and so on. People that are accessing the web via a screen reader, though, the screen reader reads the table across. So, in other words, the screen reader, if it were reading this table, would say city, January, July, October, Cleveland, 20, 83, 58. It's a lot less obvious if you're being presented the table in that mode of what it's all about. So one thing that we can do right off the bat to make the table more clear, and it's good for even people who are not visually impaired, is that we can add a caption to the table. So I can go into the table, and I can, right after, immediately after the table tag, I can put a caption. to say something like average temperature by month in cities around the world. And the caption appears sort of as a header on top of it. All right? Now, you might ask, what's the difference between doing this and just putting a paragraph or a header tag or something like that on top of it? The difference is that tag now is part of this table. All right? So conceptually, the screen reader, the HTML, because that tag belongs to the table, it makes sense that that tag is part of the table. So it goes with it, and it's logically linked to it. And of course, like anything else, we can style this. So I could make the caption have a color of blue and have a larger font size. And maybe right align the text. I made it a little too big. Let's make it a little bit smaller. All 
all right? So I can make it look the way that we want it to again. Um, never let the appearance of something keep you from using a tag. You use a tag because it's the appropriate tag to use. If you don't like the way it looks, you change it with CSS. So for example, in this case, that's a caption for this table. So it should be a caption tag. You know, don't say, well, I want it to be bold, so I made it an H1. No. If you want it to be bold, or if you want it to be bigger, you change that, you control that through the styling of it. Now, occasionally, there are rows in the table that relate to header information and footer information. For example, let's say I had maybe the average temperature worldwide, sort of like the average of the averages on the last line. That wouldn't be an individual city, that would just be like an average of all the cities that were listed. So I could do this and add a row to the table. And maybe the average January temperature is 64, the average July is 81, and the average October is 73. Now if I do that, this row is different than the other rows, right? This top row is headers. These four rows are really the data of our table. The bottom is sort of just like a, not really a summary, but sort of like totals or footer type items. There are tags that designate those sections of the table. And they are the T head. Because it's possible to have more than one row that's a header. So there's a T head that goes around all the header rows on the page. There's a T body that goes around sort of the real data of the table. And then finally, there's the T foot. That goes around the footer rows. Now this is good for people accessing this with the screen reader because it gives a little bit of extra information about these rows and it'll help those people be able to decipher the table better. Right now, it will have no impact visually on the table. Looks exactly the same. But we can use these tags to style things if we want to. I'm going to eliminate the style and, and redo the style of this table. Just now that we have those extra fields, we can maybe do some things a little different than, than we did um, originally. I'm going to go in, I'm going to get rid of the style most of the style, and I'm going to redo it. I'm going to give the table a width of 50%, minimum width of 300 pixels, border 2 pixels, solid black, and border collapse. The border collapse is what's going to make things look like grid lines instead of having boxes around each individual item. All right. So I do this and look at it, and this is what I have so far. Again, certain things are controlled by default. The TH is being bold and centered. The caption being centered. The size of the table, I said 50% with a minimum width of 300%, uh, 300 pixels. That is style uh, that I have controlled. However, if you look, 
the size of the individual cells is done based on their content. So in other words, of those 50%, the city name has the biggest thing in it, that is the word Rio de Janeiro, so therefore it gets the biggest amount of that 50%. Then when we get to the minimum size, it still keeps them sort of in that proportion. So let me go and style the caption. the table a little wider. Now let's actually pay attention to colors today. A lot of the examples I uh, have given, I've just picked like the basic colors just to, you know, just for simplicity's sake. But let's actually use uh, an HTML color generator to come up with some, some uh, good colors that actually go together and, and might be effective. All right. We talked about this way back in the beginning of the semester, but it might be a good time to, to sort of review that. So let's look for HTML color generator. I'm going to pick purple for this because purple is a cool color. And because, if you think about it, usually you think of red as being hot and you think of blue as being cold. And since these have both cold and warm cities, I'm going to pick purple because it's both blue for cold and red for warm. So we'll pick that. And I'll pick, I'll go to the color list. And I'm going to make the caption have a color of this. I'm going to make the border have this as a color as well. I think you can see that that's purple and not black. It looks pretty good. All right. Now, I can make the T body and T head and T foot have a different style. Just to let people know another way visually that these rows are a little bit different than the rest of them. So I'm going to put in my selectors for T body, T head, and T foot. And I'm going to give each one of these a slightly different color based on my color scheme designer. Let's give the headers this color. So I can say T head color T body will give this color to And then finally, the footer will give this color too. I mentioned before, this color scheme generator gives you five colors. But do remember that you sort of get you know, white, black, and, and different uh, versions of gray for free. So you can include those in the, in the list of colors. All right. So 
there, if you look, they all have slightly different colors, and that's just another way for it to stand out. All right? Now, depending on how um, elaborate we wanted to get, again, we could um, control the style even more. I'm going to center the TDs, because I think that will look better. Notice again, the correct answer isn't, if I want it centered, the correct answer is not to make it a TH, right? Even though TH is centered by default. The correct answer is, well, that's not a header, that's data. So we'll put it in a TD tag, but through our CSS, we will go and center it. Remember, it's possible to give the table conflicting information via CSS. You know, I could go in and say, I want each TH to have a width of 50%. And again, when we specify a percentage, we're talking about a percentage of the available width. So it's 50% of the 80%. Now that's clearly impossible. There's four columns. Each one of them can't have 50%. So what does a browser do? Well, it takes a shot. It actually gave the first two 50%, and then the last two it just sort of crammed in at the end. All right. The browser is remarkably resilient. All right, it can it can take pretty much whatever you throw at it and make some kind of sense of it. Um, now, whether that sense is what you intended or not is another matter altogether. All right, here is probably a better way to look at that. There we go. We could do some other things. We could make the size of the header and the footer a little bit bi uh, bigger. The size of the font, that is. We could make the body, or we could make the header have a different background color. And likewise, the footer. And again, we can apply whatever styles we want to. And pretty much anything that we learn via styles, um, you can apply to tables as well. We actually could put a background image on this if we wanted to. We could put a background image on each of the city titles if we wanted to. All right. So behind Cleveland, we could have a watermarked image of the Cleveland skyline if we wanted to. All right. So whatever we can, whatever we've learned, we could do in other contexts for CSS. We could do also for tables. The next thing we're going to look at is what we can do to help people that are visually impaired associate data with headers. So, for example, 100. What is that? Well, your eyes automatically look up and say that's for July for San Juan, and look across. So you look up and across, and immediately you know what that table cell represents. Remember that people that are hearing the table via a screen reader are simply hearing this red as a list of data. 
So they're, they're hearing city, January, July, October, Cleveland, 20, 83, 58. After a little while there, 58, what does that mean? Is that Cleveland or was that Buffalo? Is that October or is that July? You know, they lose track of that. So we have to do something very similar to what we did with forms. If you remember with forms, we had a label tag and we associated that label with a particular form field. Here, we can associate two cells together to say that this cell, the header for it, is in another cell. And you do that by, first of all, on everything that's a header, you put an ID. Now I'm going to keep things simple, and I'm going to make the ID be, for city, I'm going to make it just be the word city. For January, I'm going to make it Jan. For July, I'm going to make it J-U-L. And for October, I'm going to make it OCT. All right. Now, what I can do here is I'm going to do the same thing for the first table data cell because that's almost like a header as well, right? Cleveland isn't a temperature. That's sort of another sort of header to say that these numbers belong to Cleveland. So this number belongs to July and San Juan. So I'm going to also put an ID on these table cells. Then what I do for each table data is I specify headers equal and I specify the column that it belongs to, that is Jan, and the row that it belongs to, that is Clee. And I do that for all these table cells. Now, this is a little tedious, but it wouldn't nearly be as bad if I had done this from the start. And the other thing to remember is a lot of times our HTML code is actually generated by server-side scripts, which means we don't have to repeat it this many times. We can write a script to do that for us. So this seems a little bit like I said, tedious, but this is something we did right off the bat. It wouldn't be that bad. So this way, these header tags or these header attributes point to the columns that contain the full description of what this row is. In other words, what does this 20 represent? Well, Jan matches up with that, so the screen reader knows that it's January. 
CLE uh, matches up with this, so it knows that I'm referring to Cleveland here. So the screen reader can know that this 20 refers to January in Cleveland. We can do the same thing for the averages. Now, visually this is not going to make any difference to people viewing the screen, but the screen reader then um, can clarify if the user has any questions about what a, a particular cell represents. All right, there's a couple more things that we can do to make our tables more advanced. And back in the old days when people used tables to align the stuff on the page, they would do all sorts of crazy stuff. And you can still do this crazy stuff, and even once in a while there's even a need to do it. But I'd strongly urge you not to do some of these techniques that I'm going to describe in a second here. All right. One thing you can do is there's a row span and column span attribute that you can use to make a particular table cell go across several columns or several rows. All right. So, for example, if by some amazing coincidence it was 83 in Cleveland, both in July and October, I could do this. I could have nothing for October and say call span equals 2. That means that this table cell goes across two columns. We'll sort of put it in between there to say that. Well, well, once in a while you have a chance to do that and it makes sense, but generally speaking, I avoid these techniques. Um, it makes the table a little more complicated, makes the table a little more ha uh, hard to change if uh, you need to. And as far as accessibility goes, it, it becomes confusing to screen readers um, how that is. The other thing that people used to do is people used to nest tables or combine tables together. Like let's say, for example, if, this, if I was going to have a table that showed the average high temperature and another table that showed the average low. I actually could combine those into two tables, or into one table rather. In other words, after this average, I could put another T head section and repeat the, the, the header columns, and then repeat the cities, and, and all that. I could do that, but it would be much better instead to break it down into two separate tables. You know, keep them simple. Um, keep them simple uh, has a benefit of making it a lot easier to maintain. It's a lot less confusing, and there's less accessibility issues as far as that goes if you keep your tables pretty straightforward and simple. All right. So, that's tables. Any questions about that? Now we have, after today, five more class sessions, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. We have Wednesday, then Monday and Wednesday of the following week, and then Monday and Wednesday of the following week after that. All right. So, our goals for the last five sessions, top goal on the list is to get your project done. So bring any questions that you're running into in class, uh, bring to class any questions that you're running into as far as your project goes. And I'll either address them during class or I can, uh, we, we can make some time to do them in lab. Depending on how things go lecture-wise, you know, I may give an opportunity for you to work on 
your projects in class. In which case is a good chance for you to take and show your project to other people so that they can give you some feedback and they can get some ideas maybe of, of things to do or they can learn some by looking at your um, code as well. The other topic that we're going to talk about is we're just going to sort of uh, dip our toe into JavaScript. You know, we're not going to take the plunge and jump in completely, but we're going to start looking at JavaScript. And JavaScript is a way to add a bit of interactivity to our pages. All right? And let me give an example of JavaScript. All right? from an actual website. Here's a good one. All right. ESPN. Notice that there's a menu on the top of the page that shows NFL, Major League Baseball, NBA, NHL, NCAA, and so on down the line. This page is loaded on our computer. So what happens and we, we've gone over this diagram before, and I, I go over it a lot in a lot of my classes. What happens is, we have our client, who's someone running a web browser, connected to the internet, that asks for a web page, that request gets routed through the internet, hits the appropriate server, and the server responds with that web page. So, in other words, here I am, a client. I make a request for a web page. How do I make a request for the web page? Well, I could click on a link. That makes a request for a web page. Or I can type in the URL if I know it. When I hit return, that request is going to be routed all around the country, maybe even all around the world, believe it or not, all right, till it finds ESPN's web server, all right? ESPN's web server then sends back to me through the internet through the same process, I could go around the world till it finds me, or around the nation anyhow till it finds me, it sends me a completed web page. It's amazing how quickly that happened, right? <laughs> Given all the things that it could, could have, uh, all, all the, the whole path that it could have taken. Now, now that uh, there's a copy of that web page that's sitting on my computer, all right? And for the most part, we're not communicating with ESPN's web server anymore. We'll communicate if we go and click on a link. There we requested another page. So the same thing happened over again. But if we're just sitting here looking at this page, it's not like we're connected to their web server. But notice what happens is I put my mouse over certain menu items. the page changes a little bit, all right? If I put my mouse over NFL, I get a listing of stories related to the National Football League. If I put my mouse over MLB, I get about Major League Baseball, and so on down the line. Now, this happens immediately. 
All right. Now we have a very fast internet connection here, so it isn't as obvious. But on a slower internet connection, if we requested ESPN.com, it might take a second or so for the page to load, or a few seconds even. All right. But even on a slow internet connection, this is going to happen pretty much immediately. All right. Why does it happen immediately? Because we're not communicating with the web server, even though the page is changing. When the web server sent us a page, it sent us some instructions that add interactivity to the page. All right, it sent us some code. So we talked back when we were talking about forms, how there can be server-side scripts that take and process the data and do different things for it and customize the web page that the server is going to send us. That's one sort of script. That's scripts that are used to write a custom page for us. This script's a little bit different. This script doesn't run on the web server. It runs within the browser. All right? And it doesn't prepare a new web page for us. It simply changes the way our old web page looked. So really, what happens here is when we make a request for this, we actually get all these menus, the menus are just hidden. How are they hidden? They're hidden more than likely through CSS. Again, I'm making some assumptions. It's, it's hard to know exactly for sure what's going on without diving into the code. But more than likely, we're getting all these menus when we first request a page. And these menus are either appearing or disappearing based on our actions. So there's interactivity. And that's the one thing that's missing for a large part with HTML and CSS. There's really no interactivity. HTML is the content. CSS is the appearance. Now we can do a little bit with CSS. We can make some hover effects and we can do a few things like that. But the ability to go and make our page interact so that I put my mouse over a link, I see a different submenu. That typically is functionality that's done via JavaScript. It could be done a couple different ways, but it's typically done via JavaScript. And that's what JavaScript brings to the party. Now, we're not going to spend tons of time on, jo time on JavaScript. Or the aim isn't to make you an expert, but I do think it's important for you to see sort of JavaScript being sort of the third piece to the puzzle, what it brings to the plate and what it contributes to a web page. So we'll look at some simple examples of how JavaScript works and how it can be used to enhance a page. All right. So two things really we have to finish, our project and JavaScript. Yes? So you do JavaScript in no well, you, it's just code, right. So we can write JavaScript in, in any text editor that, that we want. Absolutely. Other questions? Exactly. Uh, we'll talk about this more in detail next time, but essentially these things form like a little triangle. The things work together. So how does JavaScript make one menu appear and another menu disappear? It, it makes it appear and disappear by manipulating the CSS. In other words, there's one of the properties about the appearance of something on a page is the visibility. All right. We can actually make things invisible in CSS, and then in JavaScript we can change it from being invisible to being visible. So this, the, the JavaScript, typically what it does is, based on user actions, it changes HTML and CSS properties of the page. Yes? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and we, we can look at examples of all of that. Um, that's actually a good one uh, to go over. Remind me Wednesday, maybe we can, uh, maybe we can uh, um, look at that. So we'll go over a few simple examples of this, just enough to sort of um, give you a sense of the capabilities of it and hopefully make you curious enough to sign up for another class. All right? Okay, we'll see you up in lab.